free. So it's just on here. Yep. Hi everyone. Hi. Hi, I'm, my, my name's Gavin Wade. I'm artist curator here at Eastside Projects and it's our great pleasure today to have with us Rajni Pereira, who's been over here for three weeks making this huge exhibition. And um, we're gonna do a little bit of an intro. Some of you might have come to the studio visit uh, a couple of months ago uh, when Rajni was out in Toronto in her studio there. Um, so we're just gonna be a bit informal, look around, talk about some things. You fire some questions at Jazz, who's holding the camera, and you can tell us, Jazz, if anyone's asking questions. Um, but we're gonna, we're gonna start here with some ancestors, which feels like a good place to begin. Um, yeah, maybe Rajni just tell us a little bit about how the ancestors appeared. Yeah, yeah, yeah this um, diptych was made for my solo exhibition named Traveler, exhibition of the same name, in Toronto in 2019. So this is an extension of, uh, of a series that at that time was mostly sort of medium-sized bust paintings of uh, immigrants in the future doing their various things, wearing their various garbs. And I wanted to think about off-worlding and a first, and a, uh, a time before the traveler, as I as the uh, as I was painting them in the present. So when you build worlds, you have to crunch time forwards and backwards yeah. a little bit and make your own history. So making a history for a future. So these will be some of the uh, like sort of a pioneering race of people who have off-worlded now and they're starting to evolve into a different, a post-human property. Yeah, I forget that you talk about them as off-worlding as well so yeah. because a lot of the the travelers are still surviving on earth on earth some undesignated point whether it's thousands of years in the future or right or perhaps not so far like, who knows but yeah but then these these are the first pioneers going out Go, maybe going out to another planet and yeah. to be fair it's not clear whether it's a harsh terrain on earth or an uninhabitable place on another planet, because yeah. both of those experiences, I, use, I would use both of those in a, as a metaphor for the immigrant experience as it is today, yeah. in any case. Yeah. So it's really hard to say, but I kind of wanted to go in between the travelers proper, who have many, many different skin colors and might have like a genetic that's been hybridized with a camouflaging animal or something like that, mm -hmm. um, engineered peoples, yeah. Uh, and a human being, so they look more like us. Yeah. You know? So it's a step before. I hadn't thought about it before. as camouflage. I suppose I thought about it almost like armor and cloud yeah. insignia and sure. Yeah, yeah, but as far as their skin colors are concerned and their body covering, maybe melanin is something also that evolves as a molecule. Mm -hmm because of uh, lifestyles or adversity or diets in the future. So I like to think all about all those little details when I imagine a physiology of a post-human, yeah, post-immigrant person. So, the whole, so the, this whole vision is, is what well, you, are, you are envisioning a new science fiction that is yes. this reflection back on your upbringing and your reality now and perhaps the near future of what, what you can anticipate. Yes, that's coming. right. That's right. And Science I, fiction is very is a very uh, important term for this because I, the science part and the fiction part you have to regard both of those and where they both come from as well. So when that comes to there's when you look at it when you like take those words apart what they separately mean and you reflect on how both of those words have come together and what they both reflect independently that's a great way to work. be introspective within sort of an aesthetic yeah. decision, you know? Yeah. And I think that's what feels like an interesting connection to what 
the context that the exhibition is happening in as well. Across the city, there is the Birmingham 2022 Festival, and that is um, a, a celebration, and I think a questioning, and an, an investigation into the idea of the Commonwealth. You know, how do we accept the idea of a Commonwealth, where it comes from, by celebrating something like the Commonwealth? What are you celebrating? Um, are you celebrating the history? Are you celebrating, do you think you can only celebrate the now yeah. without taking into account the history? And I think I felt that your idea of evolving species, evolving humanity, and an evolving body of work, yes. which would be interesting to bring yes. here that you've been working on it now for three, four years yeah. or so, more. Yes. Maybe and a little bit more, yeah. 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 And it feels like I've been working on just the horse for three or four years. Yeah. <laughs> but it hasn't been that long. It just <laughs> takes a long time to build a world and to, to uh, imagine things in a very particular way, right, and that's yeah. like that. But I do, when you're saying that you know, we are thinking about the Commonwealth and the Commonwealth Games and the celebration in a more constructive way. Mm -hmm. I think it's, I haven't seen it anywhere else in Birmingham other yeah. than with you yeah. and the gallery here. Yeah. So I really commend you just on camera, <laughs> just going to commend <laughs> Gavin and the team on using their brains during this time. It's very important not to just get caught up in some sort of yeah. celebration passively. I think there are there are other projects that are coming and I'm will okay. be will be around the city that I think complement what's happening here. Okay. But I guess that is I haven't seen it other than Yeah, we so but I think it was important we felt that our role yeah. as an artist run multiverse and as a connection to to centre artists and to introduce artists to have a voice in that image of what Birmingham is as much as what the Commonwealth is. That I think we felt we had to um, invite from the position of an, inviting anti colonial artists, in anti colonial actions, and actions that are perhaps against an idea of a Commonwealth, yes. as much as at the same time we, we really appreciate the support and yeah. the funding of those organisations, because I think that that is good in itself that they want to ask questions about the structure of the organisation. So I yes. think I'm hoping people will. Come, I mean, do you, is that what you hope that people come to see the work and they imagine it as a time element, as a time structure, as a as a growing body of work? They can see that as a parallel, not only to their own lives, but right. but this wider context of how a city grows or yeah, how yeah. society grows. Sure, I think it's really important to not binarize the conversation yeah. of of decolonizing. And then on one side, you've got, you know, normally older white conservative people who are like, what do you mean? It's given us all the luxuries we have, the privilege we enjoy. On the other side are, you know, poor folks of color just like, you know, F the Commonwealth. Like, look at my life and look at the lives of my yeah. families. Yeah. It's all because of this. And it's important to look at in between all the different things that happen there yeah. and then finding progress inside that place in That's any really case. Yeah. That's the most important thing. So having these conversations, I don't really want this work to be removed from the present day by time. Mm -hmm. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if we look into things like multiverse theory, they're saying that there are many timelines running parallel and sometimes they're touching. Mm -hmm. So that's like hyperdimensionalism and like that sort of pseudo, some people say it's pseudoscience, but I really think that you know, when I think about the future and when I think about the way we are and live and look in the future, I think that's something that touches now in many, many ways. Yeah. There are children yeah. born due to environmental conditions, especially where I come from and in yeah. India and Pakistan, where there's like a really great effect of corporate, com corporate factory pollution mm -hmm. and people living together with things like that. And climate yeah. refugee nation states where people are having to leave, where kids are now born with They've yeah. got seven fingers on one hand, they've got a couple more eyes and, you know, they're kind of walking around or they made, they're they making it into like, you know, juvenile Let's, let's go and look age. at that journey, because yeah. I yeah. think that picks up some of that, that traveling, yeah. journeying, surviving, walking through yes. landscapes that have gone through yes. what you, you know, you, you describe it as ecological collapse, like this work yes. is imagining how do we live, what, yeah. what, are, what are the future diasporas that are around the world and how are they connected yes. and with the fact that they're living in this 
what might be magical or beautiful but equally hostile it's hostile environment yeah. it's hostile yeah. so in a lot of cases in the you know such as the mural that we did at Balsam Heath which you yeah. can find out more about on my Instagram and their Instagram uh, it is about groups of climate refugees kind of traversing through adverse conditions and that can be you know I I come up with a t uh, background making technique which is a house made marbling technique on paper which I use to symbolize different types of difficult situations like wind, water, in this case it's a it's a drought, a dry landscape which has all these hills and valleys, but there's not a lot to be sort of found there and that's yeah. a that's a transition space. So in a lot of cases this marbling and these adverse conditions represent a transition space and it's not a home, it's not a place where the characters are static or can be at rest. It's a restless journey. So this piece is called Journey Drought and it's a couple families and sort of a sentinel or guardian and a protector and a water carrier that are moving through one place to another. They're meeting a friend in this one. They can see a friend in the distance and they're leaving. Um, but they're moving through a place that's di it's difficult, you know, yeah. but yeah. there's still there are still friendly gestures like waving You can see a smile here and there and they're of course very opulently and luxuriously dressed as they go Which is very important when we talk about immigrant work and the work of marginalized communities there's a trend of taking the opulence and taking the um, Beautiful part of our lives out of there, which yeah. I think is you know, it's just not factual. It's not true no, yeah. and I think I mean, that, that came a bit to the fore when you're painting the mural on the edge of Highgate and Borsal Heath as well, that yes. actually the reality of us finding a very interesting place to make a mural that, that feels like it connects into the heritage of the city, the history yes. of the city, but also a, a, a local community which is very underserved Yes, and it is a harsh reality yes. that we were operating in there and that yeah. people are living in, it's the in, it's, you know, it's inner city Birmingham. Yes. And I think there is not very far removed from, no. the, from the traveler images that you're making. No, especially so. the dress, because like those, yeah. are, those are immigrant communities, I believe they're Pakistani, Syrian, yeah. different yeah. types of Islamic communities. And yeah. of course their dress, we were there on the weekend painting, so they're going to mosques. Yeah. Once a day at least, and they look, they were looking immaculate. Yeah, they, <laughs> they were looking, yeah. just, I was just like, every time I went on, bra on break, I'm like, oh, just everything's pressed, they look fantastic, well groomed. I was just like, these travelers, yeah. these travelers. So I felt good, you know, even though it was a very difficult, challenging neighborhood to put together a public art piece, it was also, it made me feel good spending more and more time there, kind of getting out of the river and walking around. It's like, ah, oh, good, this is in a good place where you know, folks will hopefully feel connected yeah. to the experience that I'm representing. So pl please come and visit the mural. We're, we're launching it tomorrow uh, between 4 and 6 p.m. at Syrian House, which is on Belgrade Middleway, and Syrian House are making some delicious food for us as well, mm. so it's a good reason it to come good. along. It is good. I ate there twice. <laughs> it is very good food. And they're, yeah, they're really great. And, uh, and then we'll move over to launch the exhibition here at the gallery from 6 till 8 p.m. as well as Amy Lamb's exhibition on the street behind us on Floodgate Street, a recent activity from 6 till 9 p.m. But I just want to move over to the yes. horse because what you were saying earlier about how the intersection, where points touch, yes. I, it was making me think about you described this work partly coming from thinking about monuments yeah. and the idea of what's been happening around the world. Yes pulling down mo false monuments or monuments that misrepresent history. Totally, and aka and decolonizing your environment yeah. where you live. So it's about that time now. Yeah, so we have a horse, a post horse here in the gallery. Yes. So we, let's come around, come around this way, Jeff. Sure. Come on down. <laughs> it's a big one. It's a big <laughs> one. So this is, this is um, a starry-eyed subspecies. Um, it's a many multimedia piece uh, that is a, a monument sculpture. So it, it stands somewhere in between a monument paying homage to a great moment of discovery or a desperate search for something or just like this pivotal moment where someone finds something or a place to live. Um, 
whoever has lived as an, as an immigrant, finding a place to live and stay is a big deal for us, and it's very, very difficult to do that. Um, a lot of that story gets washed out, you know, in the in in representing sort of the success of when that moment happens, but the journey to that is grueling, very difficult. Um, but this stands somewhere in between a, a monument commemorating a, a moment of, of possibly a time to rest now, as well as uh, um, an investigation into the language of museum, natural history museums, and mm -hmm. are the archiving of species. So the, that, and that responds a lot more to the techniques used in putting this together. Um, this is the tax, the horse has been assembled onto a taxidermy form, which, is, which we got from a taxidermy shop, and then we had to carve and alter it into something that was desirable in this case. This, you can see like a visible mutation on the face of the horse. So it is subtle, it's not uh, really, really crazy, but it reads as a horse right off the bat. So uh, many techniques, different hair transfer techniques were used in our studio back in Toronto. It was myself and technicians, uh, Harman Carr and Emily Woodenberg working on uh, the Toronto component of this uh, installation, which uh, me, myself and Emily kept on working on here in the gallery, finishing the hair transfer. And the hair is cow hair off of an Ikea cow hair <laughs> ruck, Swedish which cow. we, Swedish cow hair. <laughs> native indigenous Swedish cow hair. And uh, yeah, so it was shaved off of the um, hide and then transferred onto the horse and then groomed and put back into order kind of the way that you would see it on a horse who's walking around. Um, and then any modifications were done with epoxy putty and then sanded down and then treated with flocking and more hair transfer, different types of flocking techniques uh, to put the horse together. The traveler is, a, is um, dressed in various different garbs and protective gear and some of it's quite distressed and some of it's newer and more beautifully sort of handmade. Um, the jacket and the hat are by Nepsidu and his Paradise Sportif line, uh, which you can look up on Instagram and enjoy at your leisure. Um, what about the flag? The flag is, yeah, from? and then the flag was something that we actually had that piece uh, sewn by a tech in the studio, and then I decided that I wanted the, this traveler to be having a flag that's representing a nation or some kind of sovereignty that's entering into or walking through this landscape. So that, uh, in regards to the landscape, this was put together with artist Matt Gale, who's here in Birmingham, who works together with fungi and fungi communities and species to make his work. So this is different mushrooms, cut from different communities. In some cases, it's forged from the wild. In other cases, it's grown in his basement. And then they're pickled and preserved and put together into what he calls hybrids in this environment. So we're using those these beautiful sort of fungal flower shapes to represent a poisonous and hazardous environment for this traveler to be walking through. Yeah. Or it feels through. like such a strong connection to Birmingham as well. Ah, uh, yeah. To actually have that collaboration with an artist here. Yeah, that was you introduced me to him. Yeah, but well, you, well, you wanted you wanted to find someone. No, who's, it's you. Who's, who's no, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wanted to. I just I don't know how it came up, but then it was you. You know, I think you brought it up at the ruin around the corner, yeah. and you're like, do you know Matt Gale? Like, how am I supposed? To? I well, don't know I, anything. But I think you must have been and saying, oh. Me. Is it, you know, wouldn't it be great to have someone who's someone, making like alien yeah, 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 future yeah, yeah. evolving plants? And I was yeah. like, oh, do you know yeah. Matt Gale? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're like, that would be, that'll be Matt Gale for you, madame. <laughs> so then you, I think you sent me his uh, Instagram profile and we just connected. We met within days and we had yeah. planned this out and it was kind of done. And the rest of it was put together uh, with d different types of elements like uh, slate from gardening centers, <laughs> slate rock, foam rocks fake plants, there are real plants here that need to be probably watered soon. Yeah, they look like they do. Reindeer moss, <laughs> two different types of moss, dyed moss, sprayed moss, you know, all put together with Matt's works to make yeah, an got, environment that reads as a... We've as got a full a list from Matt of the, of the actual fungal yes, leather and this fruits, is why we're here today, folks. Which includes Daedeliopsis confragosa. That's just one. You can come and get the full list <laughs> And you can look every single one up and work out where all these incredible species reside on our yeah. planet right now. Yes. 
Yeah, and I just think it's worth mentioning that the way that links to the kind of diorama feel that you've painted yeah. onto the walls underneath the painting. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that yeah. was part of your how you saw it in your head, wasn't it? Well, that's how I'm starting to kind of evolve the presentation of this timeline is to actually also use this as a way to question the language of museum artifacting and archiving and the presentation of natural history species because in a lot of there are a lot of museums like humanities museums or regular museums that will represent cultures of humans by making these kind of you know dioramas including the physiques of people mm -hmm. that are represented in there and normally indigenous communities and marginalized, not marginalized, but like colonized nations, the mm -hmm. way that they're represented in those, uh, in those sort of visible archives in the museum is very particular. Yeah. It's sort of oppressive. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it is problematic, right? So when I yeah. address that, yeah. and I kind of want to like subvert that, I want to, I want to play around with and investigate the way that these things are also put together because while they're problematic, they're also put together with the spirit of education and assembled with lots of love and care by yeah. the team. Yeah. So it's like, it's such a, you feel conflicted. I feel very conflicted about the presentation of anything in a museum, but there are parts about it that I think can be expanded on mm -hmm. and I think can be kind of co-opted to tell a better, more empowering story. Absolutely. Yeah, rather than ev everything being inspected and yeah, dissected. And dissected yeah, it's more how does that how does that yeah. ask the question back the other way. Exactly. I and I think it can be done. So yeah. this is my kind of foray into that. Yeah. I'm not an expert in this, so there might be problems with what I'm doing. But I'm just doing my best. I think they would be very it. useful problems if they are useful that's problems. What, <laughs> that's, what those I, are the problems that's what we want. want. Yeah, yeah. Those yeah. are the problems we need. Let's, and then let's end on a big zoom into the landscape yeah, over sure. here. <laughs> sure, this is, this is an extension of, of uh, the diorama, the sculptural installation that we put together. And you'll notice, you'll uh, recognize some of the hybrid species from the diorama that have been placed in this in the same way a natural history museum would paint a backdrop. You can go any amount of natural history museums actually present whole dioramas with texture taxiderm species an extent and an extension of a beautifully painted I'm not bragging or anything about this I tried to kind of emulate that washy painted look of the way that it's done in those institutions and then that's extended into kind of like a flat foreground and then you have the animals right at the front so this is very it's taken apart because of course I'm playing around with the placement of these but it's, elements but walking around it's made made me realize how you know because there aren't any people in this no. that we can see yeah there un aren't any animals. it's uninhabitable so that, can't live yeah there. it's quite yeah it feels quite spooky yeah it's spooky quite, yeah it's, spooky. it's like another version of what might happen totally so. because this traveler is going to a place where no one can live yeah, so we've got, he's probably got to keep moving through here, or they've got to keep moving through here, but, you know, it's an extension of, you can visit, you can see that it's an extension of the, yeah. of the diorama's floor. But I think I have really appreciated how you wanted to make something extra within the space, and you wanted to make this, and you've sort of been exploring the painting over yeah. the weeks. Yes. You know, it wasn't like you came, and you already knew exactly what it I, was. No, just... no, Gavin, I did know what I wanted to do, but it wasn't <laughs> working for me, and it wasn't yeah. doing that thing that it needed an element, which I'm realizing was water. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, yeah. To reflect the sky and like to tie it together. In the beginning, it was all these hills and valleys. It was becoming kind of too intense. I wanted it to be lighter, so bringing water into that and reflections into that, just technically and exactly. Yeah. That's how it, I was able to finish it on time as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's, it's, it's an amazing thing. thing within the space. Thank it you. Feels spectacular. Yeah, yeah, we did it. Yeah. Hey, every, yeah. We did everything we wanted for this <laughs> exhibition. Everything happened. So, cool. Thanks so, so much, Rajni. Thank you. That's Thanks really for having great. me. Were there any questions? Or do we... No, yeah. just lots of comments, complimenting cool. all the works. Oh, all right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> great. I hope you enjoyed that. We're going to go into the second gallery here for another exhibition by Bijan Musavi, who has just arrived. And we're gonna head over here. Right, see you in a minute. Right? So we come through, and we sort of put up, used our mobile wall with the wooden panels that Rajni was really interested in for the works. And he also created 
quite a dramatic entrance way of Vijay's exhibition. Hi, Vijay. Hi, Vijay. I just gave you a very loose introduction. I know you've, you've just arrived by train, but yeah. here you can already see we're, we're coming behind Rajni's space now and into the exhibition. Um, do you want to do a little intro about the how yeah. disco Islam has developed? Yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, hello everyone, and uh, yeah, sorry to seem a bit kind of like rushed. My train was actually cancelled, so yeah, I had to kind of like yeah sort out so many things before like yeah being here live on Instagram. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I was thinking. So the show that I have here. Uh, Future Disco Islam, Future Phantasmagoria. Uh, I think in order to talk about basically the show, I would probably want to talk a bit about uh, basically my practice yeah. and uh, uh, what I've done, uh, especially like in the past uh, five years, I would say. Uh, so, as Gavin said, my name is Bijan Musavi. I am an Iranian multimedia artist. Uh, and I'm based in London. Uh, I make uh, films, music, performances and installations which mainly look at the implications of the expansion of neoliberalism in the Middle East. Uh, so, I mean, in the past like five, six years, I have been mainly kind of um, imitating the uh, aesthetics of the world of advertising and commerce, uh, sci-fi movies, uh, popular culture, uh, the Islamic kitsch, and anything in between. Uh, mainly kind of like to tell uh, dystopian tales of a fully neoliberal future in the Middle East. Yeah. So what I've been trying to do like in those stories is to uh, uh, often kind of like try to demystify the neoliberal uh, myth that the only way towards freedom and democracy in the Middle East is through the liberation of the market. Um, I just want to step in there to say yeah, that you can tell this is very ambitious work. <laughs> so we've got we've got two yes. very ambitious exhibitions that are kind of world building and commenting on reality now, yeah. but also proposing ways to maneuver and change and rethink things. Yeah. And, and I forgot to mention that Bijan is a member of our extraordinary people um, associate members club. You can become a member of that also if you're an artist or a creative person and want to join. Um, and the, this, is, this has come from the open call. And I think we've been getting so many incredible pr proposals for projects. And so it feels really good to, to be just, I think we should go in because yeah. <laughs> I, you talk all this big stuff and people are thinking it's just this corridor, but it's not. There's no. another whole massive space <laughs> yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> Even though there's, there's so much work here, come inside. Welcome to Disco Islam. Mm -hmm. So, should we give some time for the viewers to see, or do you want to? Yeah, have a little, mm -hmm. a little walk at the end. Because actually, I don't know. I'm hoping you can pick up the sound. There's an ama there's amazing kind of background, industrial but also natural environment feel in the space. There's sand, real sand on the floor, and that also adds an element to the air. The air feels a little bit different in this room. That's right. So, like and then, of course, yeah. you might have noticed all of the, uh, the lights <laughs> yeah. happening all around the room. So we've just turned down the sound, so we can, you can tell us a little bit more. Yeah, sure. So basically, I mean, pretty much like the rest of my work, uh, then and then here, I have, I'm using neoliberal aesthetics to basically talk about the impact of neoliberalism in the Middle East. So this work, uh, Disco is Long Future Phantasmagoria, is mainly actually uh, based around uh, uh, a recent film of mine, which is called Disco is Long. Uh, so Disco is Long is basically a film uh, that I have very ambitiously actually categorized as a sci-fi uh, corporate video. Uh, or a basically a science fiction commercial of some sort, you can say. Um, so, so it's basically about a fictional uh, dystopian neoliberal nightclub from the future yeah. in Iran, which is built on the site of an environmental disaster, and it covers up uh, human rights violations of uh, the Iranian regime with the help of Silicon Valley technologies. Uh, as you can see, the film uses uh, basically CGI 
uh, live action and music, uh, uh, and it brings together fact and fiction to uh, uh, sort of uh, sort of create like a, a, a dystopian vision in the Middle East where. Uh, uh, the neoliberal ideology of free trade and boundless profit making uh, has resulted like in a, uh, during like a range of uh, uh, problems including uh, uh, environmental catastrophes, uh, social economic disparities, uh, a police state, uh, uh, nepotism, uh, uh, precarity uh, and also uh, the abandonment of the humanist project basically uh, in the Middle East. Mm. Um, so what I have done in this show basically, which is uh, again borrows its name uh, partly from the Disco Islam film, is yeah. that uh, Disco Islam Phantasmagoria, Future Phantasmagoria, takes some of the key elements from the film uh, and tries to basically translate them from the 2D space of the screen into the space. Yeah. Yeah, so I have, uh, or, in, or in other words, kind of like I've tried to ex expand the film into the space or uh, in a way maybe like create the disco Islam as an extension of the film. Yeah, yeah so and for doing, for, in order to do that, I have mainly sort of uh, taken some of the key elements from the film uh, and then uh, uh, basically uh, I have put like a, 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 a sort of like a visual uh, equivalent of that within the uh, basically the, the second gallery space uh, here at this uh, project. And those topics and those elements are mainly uh, basically the environmental catastrophe, like the aesthetics of the environmental catastrophes, like as you can see in the use of sand and uh, the roses. We were also supposed to have the haze or the fog, which yeah, we didn't we manage tried to, yeah, 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 we didn't manage to get the, through the, uh, yeah, the, the yeah. You've been. I think that's been really good. How you you had you've been really ambitious about how to make mm -hmm. the, the disco room, and there's, and you've gone. We've had to go through lots of versions, but you. Yeah. I mean, it looks spectacular. Mm -hmm. So I think it's yeah. really yeah. hats off to you to to well, making that work because it, there are lots of difficulties, lots of things we can't quite manage to make work, whether it's the the fire sensors in the room, yeah. the fire alarm sensors, or just actually budget. You know, this is not a That's huge great. budget budget exhibition, mm -hmm. and I think it looks incredible. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's worked really well. You've done a fantastic job. Thanks, thanks, Kevin. Yeah, but but as you say, mm -hmm. that you can you can do more versions. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. This feels like yeah. there's mm -hmm. iterations and next. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's sort of like you always have this feeling that like you literally can just go on forever, just like you know, making it bigger and bigger. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah which is an interesting uh, uh, thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, going back to uh, sort of like uh, yeah, the elements that, that I've been I've been using. There is also so apart from the environmental catastrophes, I have been also using uh, uh, sort of like the the visual language of the nightclub, as you can see in the. Uh, uh, many uh, basically lights that we have around uh, basically the room. Uh, we've got like spotlights, we've got a disco ball uh, which is half buried in the ground. Um, we have like uh, wave, like ocean wave projectors, we've got uh, logo projectors, uh, yeah. And yeah, so. And then we've got like other elements, including like techno utopianism or uh, 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 basically uh, uh, dystopias, and uh, also all of all of these Islamic kitsch, mm. uh, and all of that kind of like uh, spiced up with uh, the kind of like the neoliberal aesthetics of glitter and gloss, as you can see in the yeah. shiny sort of like surfaces around uh, basically the room. Uh, yeah, so it's been kind of like, uh, yeah, I mean, it is a uh, sort of, I think that ultimately it's, it's trying to create like a smoke and mirrors effect of, yeah. uh, you know, like the empty promises and sort of like absurd lies that the disco Islam actually is, is offering. Yeah, what, can you say something about that, the sort of status of some of the actions? Because I know before you were talking about how do you make a disco within mm -hmm. um, a Muslim community mm -hmm. culture, within an Islamic viewpoint, yeah. how do you make a halal mm -hmm. disco? This, that, well, this was something I was really interested to see, that in yeah. a way you've, you've approached that here, haven't mm -hmm. you? And that also feels about how you have to maneuver and get just the right angle to see something, to make mm -hmm. it actually acceptable or functional. Yeah. Or, but is it still a problematic what you've created here for many uh, people? Or? 
Well, I mean, of, of course, like, I think, I think one sort of, like, interesting point in this work, I would say, is uh, looking at, like, Islam uh, uh, from two basically different angles. Uh, one is in a liberal, democratic, uh, basically, society or country like the UK, mm -hmm. uh, which basically Islam is taken mainly as a, like a cultural element rather than because it doesn't have any political agency. Uh, anymore, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, basically from the other angle would be the Iranian angle, where, where basically I'm from. Uh, in Iran, basically the Iranian law is based in Sharia law, so uh, it's basically sort of like whatever you want to do, that's like your red line. Yeah. Uh, so then again, like I think in this project, so this project basically comes in a way from uh, my own personal experience of being involved with the underground uh, art basically scene in Iran uh, and, and underground uh, uh, music scene in Iran also. So it was uh, sort of, I mean it's kind of a bit of a long story but um, if I want to kind of like really sort of compress it into a few sentences it would be that after the 1979 revolution there was a turn into like an Islamic basically mm -hmm. government in Iran uh, the first decade there was almost like no music, it was almost like illegal. Yeah. The second decade, and then there was a war as well. The second decade, so that's the 90s, there was like a, after the war, like there was this will to rebuild the country and everything. So there was sort of like more liberal kind of like ideas, but mainly within the sort of like the, the market rather than uh, 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 culture. But then it's sort of like the cultural kind of like uh, reform also like came a bit late that when there was a president who came in with sort of like ideas like uh, uh, what is it, the dialogue between civilizations and sort of, you know, like opening up to the world and stuff like that. So, and then they allowed actually popular pop music for the first time yeah. uh, uh, in, in Iran to, to, I mean, like I remember it was kind of like, you know, it was sort of as if, I don't know, you're seeing like a phenomenon for the very first time, you know, like pop music. With, with vocals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. But you know, like, but still, obviously, within the limits of the Iranian kind of like law. So you have to, uh, uh, you know, sing certain songs. Like you, you, you can't like basically uh, talk about uh, a love between humans. You can only talk about love between the human and and, and the god uh, and stuff like that. So uh, and then as on side of the popular popular music. Uh, basically, phenomenon which, which took place in you know, like around uh, like early to mid 90s. Uh, uh, the underground, uh, basically, uh, the underground in Iran started to, uh, in a way, use the tools which, you know, because for pop music now they were allowing guitar shops. You know, they used to be like in the 80s. They would, if you're carrying a guitar, they would basically break your guitar, like the, wow. you know, the, uh, uh, yeah, sort of like the artificial. The, 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 of those passages or like the, the uh, kind of like unofficial sort of like police in Iran. Uh, so, but now you have like guitar shops and you know like, uh, so people, you know on the side of the popular culture mainstream, there was like the underground uh, uh, basically phenomenon taking place. Uh, and then although like that underground phenomenon is kind of like more or less over, but I think it sort of like, it subverted kind of like uh, uh, the Iranian sort of like uh, 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 culture, sort of like uh, uh, cultural hegemony of, of the time uh, through basically artistic sort of like mediums. Yeah. But then, so what happens is that like in, in sort of like um, around like mid 2000 or like late 2000 um, uh, or maybe even like a bit later than that, there was like a, a, a kind of like an explicitly neoliberal kind of government uh, took uh, uh, the power in Iran. And one of the sort of like things that they did was that they tried to, uh, in a way, bring that underground, uh, uh, you know, like art scene over the ground and uh, sort of make it official so that they kind of like make it uh, uh, less dangerous or, mm. or you know, threatening. Yeah. And uh, by doing that, they also, so they were basically uh, compensating people who, who were willing to, so they were asking people to sort of like, uh, in a way, um, uh, you know, kind of like um, put themselves within the kind of like restraints or the requirements mm -hmm. of the law. Yeah. 
and becomes, become uh, official. Yeah, they become official, exactly. Yeah. And but then that's inviting them to do that. Uh -huh. Inviting them yes, to do that. Yes, so, they were, really, so they were actively yeah. Yeah, encouraging the private sector to basically bring those people out and, you know, like try to, uh, and then compensate them with money, you know, by basically uh, uh, you know, putting the uh, music for sale. So this has been kind of like a trend which has gone into like really absurd places. Like in this film, I actually um, uh, mention um, sort of like a few things. Uh, so basically, this film I claim is made by a uh, like a startup company called uh, Future Islam a Trademark. So this is actually like another project. I mean, the work that I've done in the past five years. Uh, I'm claiming it to be kind of products of yeah. the, the uh, future Islam trademark. Uh, and I say this is a company that uh, uh, basically uh, uh, renders neoliberal projects in Iran by depoliticizing them. So it's like a, a company that uh, helps people to make themselves more neoliberal and, and uh, kind of by depoliticizing themselves and stuff like that. So in this film, I also claim that. Uh, some of the real stuff that has happened in Iran is also part of the portfolio of the company and those things are for instance there is a um, you know like a, a version of X Factor uh, 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 you know which is made like in Iran on official television but obviously right. women are not allowed to sing and uh, uh, usually kind of you see the winners or like kind of like the best before like everyone's encouraged to sing nationalistic songs or songs right. you know like uh, in a way devoted to religious like you know like imams or, or like the prophet or like stuff like that or like there are uh, like fashion shows where like they use like uh, uh, what is it, like AR technology augmented reality to in a way basically wipe the model's body uh, and only keep the clothes on. So it's mm -hmm. kind of like, yeah, I've got parts of like the actual uh, right. video reports of those in the film as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that you basically see like a, 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 a basically a, a catwalk where uh, the body has been erased so that the problem is solved. Yeah. So these were all kind of like ideas that helped me uh, or kind of like uh, made me sort of like yeah feel this urge to sort of talk about these things. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean obviously because this is kind of you know like the neoliberal policy is something that um, IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank are kind of like prescribing for uh, countries in the global south, including Iran, by saying that yeah take up these policies and uh, you know open the market and and uh, freedom will come. Uh, but what's actually happening is that it seems as if like, you know, the neoliberal kind of like technology or technology of our time is just, um, you know, putting the sort of like those uh, uh, basic kind of humanist sensitivities under the carpet and just carrying on with empty sort of like promises and... Uh, yeah, to yeah. treat that, to treat what's happening in Western cultures as if, yeah. as if that's complete freedom for everybody and it's all yeah, equality yeah. Is, is the kind of terrible lie, isn't it? Absolutely, and, and yeah. as if like there is no other way, this is the only way, uh, yeah. Yeah. which is yeah. not true. Yeah. So we, I said that this was an ambitious project. <laughs> Thank you <laughs> very much, Bijan, Thank you. Yeah. just giving us a bit of an insight, and I hope you can come along and see, watch the whole film. And let's turn the let's turn the music up now, so just yeah. to end with a Maybe bit of sound. Do that, I, music. Just, I yeah. also wanted to thank you guys, everyone hey. at Eastside Project, yeah, especially Amelia Hawk, which has been like really supportive, and, and uh, uh, she's been there like every every single minute for me, and uh, uh, also. Dinosaur so kill me, boom, without uh, basically his help, none of this would have happened. Uh, Ruth as well, uh, yeah. uh, Gavin as well, like literally like everyone, it's, it's been like really amazing working with you and thank you for everything. Uh, yeah, thanks, I Bish. really mean it. No, well, that's what we're here for. <laughs> thank you, yes. <laughs> All right, so I hope you enjoyed that and um, hope to see you tomorrow night. Come and see it all in, uh, in, in reality. All right, see you soon. Cheers. Bye. Take care, see you tomorrow, bye.